I called up three vaccine researchers working on three different types of vaccines. Thank you so much for joining us, especially given how busy you must be right now. All right. So the traditional way that vaccines have been made is to inject either a weakened or dead version of the virus into the body so that the immune system is prepared to fight the real thing. But many of the COVID-19 vaccines currently in development are using new technology. Hello, my name is Dr. Peter Hotez and our team was developing a recombinant protein vaccine. My name is Joseph Kim. Inovio is working on a DNA-based vaccine for COVID-19. My name is Catherine Jansen, and we are working on mRNA vaccine candidates to protect against COVID-19. There are over 30 companies working on different types of vaccines, and these three researchers are all at different stages of the timeline. We're now in the process of preparing our application to get the green light to begin clinical trials. Inovio is currently conducting a phase one studies for its vaccine. We are currently in a phase one, two trial in the United States and in Germany, evaluating four vaccine candidates. Coronaviruses are RNA viruses, but your vaccine is a DNA vaccine. So how does that work? Inovio's DNA vaccines work by injecting snippets of DNA as a vaccine into the person's skin cells. The DNA, once delivered, instructs the cells to manufacture the antigens encoded by the DNA. And then once these antigens are produced in the body, the immune system of that person reacts to it by generating strong immune responses against those antigens. So an antigen is a molecule that's foreign to your body and can elicit an immune response. DNA and RNA vaccines, instead of giving you the virus, they're giving you some genetic code that your own cells can use to make a small piece of the virus. And then that's what your immune system is exposed to and that's what it knows how to fight. The beauty of this is a safe way to teach the immune system what the real intruder would look like. So mRNA is coding to make proteins. Our cells are loaded up with mRNAs that are coding for many different proteins that are required in a human cell to do what the cell needs to do. DNA codes for RNA. RNA contains the instructions to make proteins and proteins are the basic building blocks for many parts of our body. So we're taking advantage of this, of making a specific mRNA that now is not coding for a cellular protein, but it's actually coding for a viral protein. Compare this to a protein-based vaccine. Our recombinant protein vaccine contains pieces of the pathogen that we're hoping to protect against. Can you define the recombinant protein vaccine that your team's working on? You're basically immunizing with a piece of the virus, and that piece is genetically engineered into yeast. So the way our vaccine works is we formulate it with something called alum to make it more immunogenic, and then you inject it, and it elicits an immune response consisting of antibody and also T cells. And how is a protein vaccine different to an RNA or a DNA vaccine? Well, a protein together with the aluminum, what's called adjuvant, has the ability to directly stimulate the production of antibodies. That's in contrast to an RNA or DNA vaccine, whereby the RNA or DNA has to be taken up by a cell, and then one of your own host cells has to manufacture parts of the protein and then present it to the immune response. So it's two or three degrees of separation away from directly presenting to the immune system. The advantages of our vaccine, this is an old established technology that we know can make a vaccine. The RNA and DNA vaccines, they've never led to the licensure of a vaccine before. The advantage of the RNA and DNA approach is you can make them pretty quickly and accelerate the time frame. Most COVID-19 vaccine development started back in early January when Chinese scientists first shared the genetic sequence for this new virus with scientists around the world. We were working on a seasonal influenza vaccine based on mRNA when the pandemic came upon us 
fast and furiously. When the Chinese made the sequence available of SARS-CoV-2, our partners at BioNTech, they took the sequence and immediately started to make COVID-19 specific mRNA constructs. We were able to design a vaccine sequence in three hours by applying the known DNA sequence of the virus, which was available from China, leveraging what we know of the coronaviruses and what targets are appropriate as a vaccine targets, we were able to hone in and extract out the DNA sequence for the spike protein and then turn that sequence into a very well optimized vaccine sequence. Both of these nucleic acid vaccine companies built their vaccines from scratch once they downloaded the genetic sequence for this new virus. Dr. Hotez's team had a different reaction when they saw the genetic sequence. I'll never forget it when they put their data up on BioArchive and I downloaded and said, holy crap, we may have a vaccine that could cross protect. We've been working on uh, coronavirus vaccines since 2011 for nine years. The team at Baylor College realized that they might have a vaccine in their freezer that would work against this new coronavirus. Mary Elena, my science co-partner, had the vision to keep it on stability protocol, meaning that in case people did get interested in it, when you put a vaccine on stability, is take it out of the freezer every six months and confirm that it hasn't been corrupted or degraded. What we had was we had the genetic code of the virus, and most importantly, since we were focused on a component of that spike protein called the receptor binding domain, you know, if you look at a picture of COVID-19, it looks like a donut with a piece of RNA stuffed inside and then emanating out of the donut of those spikes. And the rounded end of those spikes is the receptor binding domain that docks with the receptor. And we saw that there was quite a bit of similarity. It was not a perfect match, but close enough that we thought that uh, our vaccine could cross protect. Vaccine research begins with preclinical trials on animals. What animals have you been testing your vaccine in? We've been testing our vaccines in two types of mice. One is a genetically modified mice that uh, makes the human ACE2 receptor. The other are mice that are infected with mouse adapted virus. Vaccine candidates start in mice because they're you know, very easy to deal with. Mice are easy to come by. You can test many, many different constructs in a mouse. It's a pre-screen. Okay. And so a lot of constructs went into mice. Four came up on top. They gave good responses, T-cell responses, expected T-cell, humoral B-cell responses to make antibody, and the innate responses. So typically, preclinical trials take years as we heard from Dr. Hotez. But right now, these companies are getting through preclinical trials remarkably fast. And how is it that you were able to start preclinical development on day one? We just did it faster and in parallel. We started the mouse testing, same time as the guinea pigs, almost the same time as the rabbits, almost the same time as the non-human primates. These are usually done in a serial steps. We just did everything in parallel. Everything happens in parallel, but we are in a very unique situation right now in such an emergency. The question was, can we make a decision in a mouse across those four constructs? And the answer was no, because mice ain't men. So we have to learn what would give us the most potent vaccine construct. Actually, we made the decision to move this into clinical studies. This is often being pitched as a race between vaccines. and I don't see it that way. I think you're going to probably see multiple vaccines emerge. Once researchers are satisfied with the immune response that they're seeing in preclinical testing, then they move on to human testing. How far into clinical trials are you and what's that process been like? We just started a phase one trial beginning of April with the first volunteer being dosed. All 40 volunteers received their first dose. So we have developed a phase one, two program that is really also a unicum, <laughs> very unique, because it is what we call a seamless trial. So it starts with a small group of individuals that will receive the four candidates. We then will make very quick 
real life decisions based on the emerging data of which candidates will move ahead and which candidates will be eliminated. Pfizer is doing phases one and two of its clinical trials at the same time. And many companies are doing a lot more in parallel than would normally happen. What all of these vaccine scientists are looking for is the right kind of immune response. What kind of immune response did you see with your vaccine? We were able to see very strong, robust, antibody and T-cell immune responses against our vaccine antigen. The immune response that our vaccine is inducing is actually able to prevent the infection or at least the disease in the animals. That is to induce a response that we call an innate immune response. So that's usually immune response that recognizes danger signals like there's a virus coming in or there's a bacterium coming in. While this is happening, the RNA is also inducing what we call adaptive immune responses. So here we get T-cell responses, both T-cells that give help to other parts of the immune system, but also T-cells that by themselves can recognize virally infected cells and kill those cells to eradicate the infection. So that was also very important. And the third form, is what we call the humoral part of the immune response. So that's the immune response that produces protective antibodies. So we like the RNA because all three arms of the immune system are triggered at the same time. Can you walk me through how your vaccine would work in somebody's body? The immune system sees these genetically engineered antigens and produces an antibody, and the antibody binds to the spike protein of the virus and shuts the virus down. Once a vaccine makes it through testing, the next major challenge is storage, and the stability of a vaccine can make it or break it. How does a protein vaccine compare to RNA DNA vaccines in terms of stability and what temperature you have to keep it at? DNA vaccines, another advantage is you don't need to keep it cold. Our vaccine you need to keep cold. DNA plasmid is one of the most stable biological molecules in the world. We've demonstrated our long-term storage is at normal refrigeration temperature. We can make it set down in room temperature for over a year with perfect stability. Our vaccine candidates right now are stored uh, frozen. The stability of RNA, there's still some work to do. In order to get the RNA into the cell, it needs to be formulated, for lack of a better description, in a little fat droplet. So there are lipids involved. So they surround the RNA, they help stabilize the RNA. And so this little fat droplet then serves as a vehicle to be taken up by a human cell. Once a vaccine's made it through clinical trials and safety testing, the next big step is scaling up and manufacturing. I think the way the approach nationally has been to try to get lots of vaccines accelerated into clinical trials, so you get lots of shots on goal. And then you have this interesting phenomenon of manufacturing at risk. That's the term Dr. Fauci uses, which is manufacturing these vaccines at scale, even though you don't know it's going to work or if it's safe. We've been thinking about scaling up our manufacturing of these vaccines from day one. You know, if we're successful with COVID-19 vaccine, we need to manufacture billion doses a year, yeah. right? Potentially yeah. at least hundreds of millions of doses a year. So that's a scale that we were not previously built to handle. Thankfully, there are a lot of folks who have committed both from the government levels and the NGO levels to support the scale up. We have this, of course, in mind and already working on the scale up activities to at least produce hundreds of millions of doses. The question on everyone's mind, when will we have a vaccine? If everything goes well, and if the emergency use path is available, potentially by the end of this year. I don't see a path by which you're going to have a vaccine available by the fall. I don't see how it's possible to collect sufficient data to show one, the vaccine works, and second, that the vaccine is safe. In our situation, we don't have years, we don't have months. Time is up. We need to be really, really fast. 
What took years, we now do in months. In my wildest dreams, I would have never even imagined that this is possible. This accelerated timeline for development of a COVID-19 vaccine is unprecedented. We have never seen vaccine development happen at this rate with so many different candidates all being tested to fight the same virus. We're seeing cutting edge, never before approved technologies being tried and tested alongside much more traditional methods. There are so many different kinds of vaccines being developed right now, so I hope this brings some clarity about the different methods that are being used. And check out my other video, which explains just how soon we might have a vaccine. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with me. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you all. No problem at all. All the best. Bye-bye.